Here is the real reason why God cannot kill Satan and the fallen angels. Mystic world. God expelled Satan from heaven due to his sin and rebellion. Jesus said he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. But why didn't God just kill Satan and banish him forever? Why does Satan still exist? In today's Bible study, we will uncover the truth behind why God cannot and will not kill Satan or his fallen angels. Satan is a well-known biblical figure today. What most people do not know, however, is that the word Satan means adversary or enemy. It can also mean fallen. Note that his name is not the fallen one, but rather a fallen one, meaning it is in the continuous present tense. This implies that he is continuously falling, constantly becoming darker and more wicked. The book of Revelation says that he was thrown into a bottomless pit, meaning he is constantly falling. This is what pride does to you. It makes you worse over time. If you do not deal with pride in your life, it will destroy you. Proverbs 16.18 says that pride goes before destruction, and note that destruction is not always death, because David said in Psalm 3.4 that God redeems his life from destruction. Destruction can be happening in your life while you are still alive. Your pride can be destroying your relationships, your finances, and opportunities that God is placing before you. So how can you reverse this? Through humility, Satan, also known by some as Lucifer, is the ancient tempter who has been trying to deceive humanity into disobeying God for thousands of years. Satan began as an angel in heaven, created by God for his glory and praise. But Satan was not content just serving and worshipping God. No, he wanted to be served and worshipped. He wanted to be seen as equal to or even superior to Almighty God. Therefore, Satan organized a rebellion in heaven, gathered an army of angels, and turned their intentions against those of God. These angels are known as fallen angels. The war in heaven was fierce. On one side, the archangel Michael and his army of angelic warriors. On the other, Satan in the form of a massive dragon with thousands and thousands of demons. God's dominion, however, could not be successfully overthrown, and the battle ended with Satan and his angels being expelled from heaven. Revelation 12, the 7, the 8 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But they were not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. You can see that Satan and his angels had a place, a position, and a dimension in the heavenly realm, but they lost it. However, as a Christian, you have gained a place in heaven. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. But why didn't God just kill Satan and all his angels? Why allow them to escape to the earth to cause death and destruction to humanity? That is the question we will ask in today's video. Stay tuned for the answers. The main reason is that God cannot kill Satan or his angels because they were created by God and in the likeness of God who is spirit. God is a spirit according to John 4.24. Therefore, Lucifer and his angels are spirits and thus cannot die. The fact that Satan is alive means that God has a specific purpose for him. God has a plan for all creatures. He created them all with a purpose. And even when creation does not choose the will of the Creator, God has a way of using circumstances, poor choices, and decisions for His glory. Therefore, let's examine who Satan is and how God is using Satan today. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, we see how Satan fell from heaven. This text provides us with a view of what the Bible says about his rebellion. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the north. 
I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. Yet you will be brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. Another name commonly attributed to Satan is Lucifer, which literally means light bearer. We see that Lucifer was cast down due to his prideful ambitions. This scripture is a clear statement of what happened to Lucifer. Another reference to the fall of Satan is found in the book of Ezekiel chapter 28. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite and emerald, topaz, onyx and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Ezekiel speaks here of a perfect being who was created by God to be beautiful and precious. But then something happened. Wickedness was found in this being. He sinned, and because of that sin, God cast the being out of paradise. This is a second reference to the fall of Satan. He fell because there was a seed of mistrust in him. Something proud was growing inside him, something that God could not allow in heaven. The reality is this. Satan was a high-ranking angel in heaven, but he fell so far that he became not only Satan the fallen, but also Satan the tempter, so arrogant in his ways that he could not help leading others astray, just as he had deviated. Satan is also an accuser, as seen in the book of Zechariah chapter 3, where we have a clear image of Joshua before God, with Satan at his right hand, bringing accusations against him. In the New Testament, we see that Satan still torments humanity. Even the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted by Satan for 40 days in the wilderness. Later in his ministry, Jesus makes a statement confirming the Old Testament view of Satan's origin, when in Luke 10:18, he states that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. An example is found in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of deep darkness to be held for judgment, Jude also says in the first chapter of his letter, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Satan is allowed to live, yes, but he will ultimately be held accountable for his sins. This again gives us some clarity on why God cannot kill Satan and his fallen angels. It would not be just to kill a criminal before a fair trial. God is waiting for the world's judgment, where all will be judged and rewarded according to their deeds. I hope you enjoyed the video. If this video have some interesting idea, leave your opinion on the topic of the video in the comments, always respecting the opinions of others. Together, we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. To answer the question at hand, we must first examine who God really is. The fact is that certain sacred attributes of God cause him to act in a certain way. Moreover, as God is always the same, never changing, if we can figure out who he is, then we can reliably understand why he does what he does. God's actions are always a manifestation of his nature. In other words, what God does stems from who he is. The first thing to remember when asking this question is that God is omnipotent. Indeed, there can be no challenge to his authority because he holds all the power of the universe at his disposal. If you think about it, it makes total sense. Nothing that is created can be greater than its creator. 
If God indeed created all beings and all things, as the Bible asserts, then it's obvious that none of his created beings can rise to a position of authority above him. A common misunderstanding about Satan is that he is God's supreme enemy. Some believe that Satan and God are locked in a battle for the universe. Some believe that God only managed to defend heaven by expelling Satan and his demons. It is a grave mistake to think this way. God has no rival. No one comes close to him in power, not even Satan. The battle for heaven, from God's perspective, was not actually a battle. There was no possibility of Satan winning against the almighty creator of heaven and earth. The event is recorded in Revelation 12, 7, 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. There is something beautiful in the nature of God in that he does not immediately kill Satan. This act of mercy shows that God loves his creatures even when they do not love him back. The second thing we must understand about who God is is that he is omniscient. Every little and seemingly insignificant detail of the universe is intimately known by God. There are no exceptions to this statement. God has a complete understanding of every individual, every situation, and every choice that individual makes. This means that God has a perspective unlike any other being in the world. He is able to see completely both sides of any story. The Bible says very little about why Satan did what he did. It says he became jealous and proud of God. The omniscient nature of God means that he knew the thoughts and motives of Satan and his demons in complete detail. He fully understood why Satan did what he did. This once again shows us an incredible aspect of the nature of God, compassion. A father does not punish a child if he understands why the child did what they did. A loving father gives his children repeated opportunities to correct what they did wrong. One of the reasons God cannot kill Satan and his followers is that he fully understands why Satan did what he did. To us it may seem like madness, but God knew why Satan rebelled and had compassion for him. This means that although we do not understand why God allows Satan and his angels to remain in existence, God does. He fully comprehends why he does what he does. Free will is a gift given by God to all his creation. In summary, instead of using his impressive power to force all creation to worship him, he gives each individual creature the choice to follow him. This gift was extended to all creation and to all creatures, including angels. Because angels were recipients of the gift of free will, there was always the possibility that one day an angel or a group of angels would use their gift to make the decision not to follow God. The reason God gave free will was necessary. The point is that free will is an essential ingredient in genuine love. You cannot love someone or have a good relationship with someone if you do not have the option to do so. Love cannot be forced, it must be given to another by choice. For this reason, God, who desires his creation to love him by their own choice, gives them free will, fully aware that some will choose not to love him back. The problem that arises because of free will is this. If God punishes and kills everyone who exercises the gift he gave them in a way he does not approve of, did he really give them a choice? You don't really have a choice if one of your two options carries a certain death penalty attached to it. No, free will requires that both the possibility of rebellion and redemption remain in existence. Thus, because God is just and equitable, he chooses to honor Satan's choice to abandon his position in heaven. 
He will not be overthrown, but he will not eliminate those who choose poorly. Please don't forget hit the notification bell, subscribe and join our community to discover the mystic world together, where every episode open a new door to the unknown. There is one more theory about why God allowed Satan and his demons to live after their rebellion. If we read the gospel accounts of Jesus' life in the New Testament, we see that Satan had a role to play in Jesus' path to the cross. It may be that even when Satan had rejected God, God would still use him to fulfill his ultimate mission of ridding the world of sin. The first time Satan appears in the New Testament is when he tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Three times Satan comes to Jesus with various temptations, and Jesus stands his ground, quoting scriptures back to the tempter. Jesus became the first human being to resist Satan's tempting remarks. This is a crucial section of Jesus' story because it proves that he is worthy to die for sin. Why? Because only an innocent person can take the place of a guilty one. When an innocent person takes the place of a criminal in jail, the innocence of that person is transferred to the guilty person. They swap places. God's plan was to transfer the holiness of Jesus to sinful humanity. That is what Jesus did on the cross. He became sin and put his holiness upon us. The temptation and success against temptation proved that Jesus was worthy to bear the sin of the world. Perhaps that is why God let Satan go, so he could prove that Jesus was worthy of his task. The second important role of Satan in the story of Jesus is in his temptation of Judas Iscariot, the man who would betray Jesus and hand him over to the officials to be crucified. Have you ever wondered how Jesus would die for the sins of the world if someone didn't hand him over to be crucified? Satan's role in Jesus' life was to enter Judas and make him doubt Jesus' power to the point of handing him over to be killed. Perhaps God let Satan live so he could persuade Judas to kill Jesus and thus save the world from sin. Satan was an angel in heaven who rebelled against God's authority and managed to gather a huge army of angels who shared his rebellion against God. They fought in heaven, and instead of being killed, they were cast out of heaven as exiles. Why didn't God kill them for their rebellion? Perhaps because Satan had a greater role to play in the story of redemption. Perhaps he was another tool in God's arsenal. Perhaps God loved Satan so much that he wanted to give him a chance to repent and follow him again. Perhaps God's love is so great that he gave Satan all the time in the world to correct his mistakes. We know that love cannot exist without choice, and God's desire is for all creation to love him. Therefore God grants free will to his creation, and with free will also comes the possibility of rejection. God cannot kill all those who do not choose him that would negate the free will that leads to love. God chooses to let Satan and his demons live because God is love, and love is extremely patient. The question raised about why God does not definitively eliminate Satan is complex and multifaceted. This topic leads us into deep contemplation about the nature of God, freedom, and the purpose of evil and choice in the world. Firstly, it's essential to understand that God, being omniscient and omnipotent, has a perfect plan for everything that exists. If Satan still exists, it's because in some way he is part of this divine plan. Although it may be difficult to understand God's reasons with our limited human perception, we can trust that there is a greater and beneficial purpose behind every divine decision. Moreover, the existence of Satan serves as a continual test for humanity. Temptation is not just a sign of weakness or evil, it is also an opportunity for spiritual and moral growth. By facing and overcoming temptations, people can develop virtues such as strength, perseverance, and faith. These challenges are essential for spiritual growth and maturity. Another point to consider is that the story of Satan's rebellion reminds us of the importance of free will. God created beings with the ability to choose, valuing authenticity and freedom over forced obedience. 
True love and true goodness emerge when chosen freely, not when imposed. The concept of free will is foundational to understanding the nature of true love and goodness in the biblical narrative. The Bible presents free will as a divine gift, allowing human beings the ability to make choices, including the most profound choice of all, to love and follow God. This freedom to choose is what makes love genuine and goodness authentic, as both must be given freely, not coerced or imposed. Throughout Scripture, the theme of free will is intricately woven into the fabric of God's relationship with humanity, illustrating that true love and goodness cannot exist without the freedom to choose. The Bible begins with the story of creation in the book of Genesis, where God creates humanity in His own image, Genesis 1.27. This image includes the capacity for moral decision-making, reflecting God's nature as a being who makes choices. The first human beings, Adam and Eve, were placed in the Garden of Eden and given the freedom to eat from any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 16-17 this command was not just a test of obedience, but also an affirmation of their free will. They were free to choose, and their choice would have consequences. The story of Adam and Eve illustrates the importance of free will in the biblical narrative. Their choice to eat the forbidden fruit was a misuse of their freedom, leading to the fall and the introduction of sin into the world. However, this act of disobedience did not negate the value of free will. Instead, it highlighted the significance of human freedom and the moral responsibility that comes with it. God did not create automatons who would follow him without question. He created beings capable of making choices, even wrong ones, because only in such a context can true love and true goodness emerge. One of the central messages of the Bible is that God desires a relationship with humanity based on love. This love, however, must be freely given. In Deuteronomy 30.19, God sets before the Israelites a choice between life and death, blessings and curses, and urges them to choose life. This choice underscores the importance of free will in the relationship between God and His people. God does not force anyone to love or obey Him. Instead, He invites them to choose Him freely. The New Testament further emphasizes this principle. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. This verse portrays Jesus as a gentleman who respects our freedom to choose. He knocks but does not force his way in. Love, in its truest form, cannot be demanded or imposed. It must be freely chosen, and this freedom to choose is a testament to God's respect for human autonomy. Just as love must be chosen freely, so must goodness. The Bible teaches that true goodness is not merely the absence of sin, but the active pursuit of righteousness, something that requires choice. In James 1.27, the Apostle defines pure and faultless religion as caring for orphans and widows in their distress and keeping oneself from being polluted by the world. These acts of goodness are meaningful precisely because they are chosen, not compelled. The parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 25-37, also illustrates this point. The Samaritan's decision to help the wounded man on the road was an act of goodness that stemmed from his free will. He was not obligated by law or social expectation to help. In fact, others passed by without offering assistance. The Samaritan's act of compassion was powerful because it was a choice, a choice to do good, even when it was inconvenient and costly. This story teaches that goodness, like love, is most profound when it is the result of a conscious decision. The Bible's narrative of redemption is also deeply intertwined with the concept of free will. God's plan for salvation through Jesus Christ is an open invitation to all humanity, but it requires a response, a choice. 
John 3.16, perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible, states, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The word whoever indicates that salvation is available to all, but it must be accepted freely. Romans 10.9 echoes this sentiment. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This verse underscores the role of free will in the process of salvation. God offers redemption, but it is up to each individual to accept or reject it. The choice to follow Christ is the most significant exercise of free will, leading to a life of true love and goodness that is freely chosen. In conclusion, the Bible presents free will as a vital component of true love and goodness. God's respect for human freedom is evident throughout Scripture, from the creation story in Genesis to the tale about Lucifer and the fallen angels. Love and goodness in their truest forms cannot be coerced or imposed. They must be chosen freely. This freedom to choose is what makes love genuine and goodness authentic. It is through the exercise of free will that humanity can enter into a meaningful relationship with God, characterized by true love and the pursuit of goodness. If this content was valuable to you, I ask that you support me with your subscription so you do not miss any of our upcoming videos. Share this video with family and friends, give it a like, and leave your opinion in the comments. This helps the video reach more people. Thank you for being here and may God bless you. Reveal seven Christians who will be thrown into hell. You must listen to these warnings. Mystic World. In this video, we will discover the seven Christians who will not enter heaven. Stay tuned and watch until the end of the video to make sure you are not making any of these mistakes. The first Christian who will not enter heaven is a Christian who loves money and material possessions. The terms Christianity and material prosperity are so intertwined today that they are almost indistinguishable from each other. It's not surprising that this is the case. We know that God does not wish ruin or misery on anyone, but you should know that according to the Bible, Christianity and wealth were not always common and inseparable terms. In fact, Jesus himself made a highly controversial statement about wealth in Matthew 19, 23, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. There are various interpretations of this passage. The certain thing is that Jesus warns how terribly difficult it is to have riches and enter the kingdom of heaven. But is there something wrong with having riches and being a Christian? In reality, there is nothing wrong with this. God has immense riches and owns all treasures. He owns gold and silver and can give them to whoever he wishes. The big problem then lies in the love of money. We cannot serve God and at the same time serve wealth, according to Matthew 6.24. But then, is it possible to be a Christian and love money? Does not the Bible say that the love of money is the same as idolatry? As incredible as it may seem, it is possible to be a Christian and love money. Let's see what the Apostle has to say about this in 1 Timothy 6, 9-10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. In this passage, not only is it stated that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, but it also makes a surprising statement. It is possible to stray from the Christian faith because of greed. The passage clearly warns about the destruction that the love of money can produce. The word destruction is not very fashionable today in churches. None of us would like to hear it, much less experience it. But unfortunately, no one is exempt from experiencing it if they start chasing after money. 
The sad part of all this is that the gospel being preached today is in many cases idolatrous. The very leaders who should be guiding the sheep along the path of truth and eternal life are taking it upon themselves through the misinterpreted doctrine of prosperity to sow in believers the greed and love for material things. You might be wondering, how should a true Christian view money? The answer is quite simple. We should see money the same way Christ saw it. Let's consider just three passages where Christ expresses his will in this respect. Matthew 6:25. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, nor about your body, what you will wear. Luke 16:13. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew 6:33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In these and many other words of Jesus, it is absolutely clear that money and material prosperity should in no way take center stage in our lives. What a child of God should primarily seek is to please their father through love and justice, knowing that their father will never leave them nor forsake them. A true child of God does not worry about acquiring wealth. They know that God can provide it whenever he wishes, according to his eternal and perfect purposes in Christ Jesus. The second Christian who will not enter heaven is a Christian who does not know how to forgive others' offenses. This is probably the most common sin among Christians today, and the most serious according to the Bible. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this in Matthew 6, 14-15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Notice how forceful Jesus is with that statement. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is the essence of the gospel. A person who does not understand how many sins they have been forgiven cannot forgive those who offend them. Every day, we must learn to forgive those who offend us and cause us pain. This is definitely one of the most difficult and painful exercises in the Christian life, but it is an absolutely necessary exercise in shaping our character. If our Lord Jesus Christ, despite being wounded, slapped, struck, pierced, unjustly accused and publicly stripped, could say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Why can't we do the same with those who offend us every day in much less severe ways? One thing is certain, if we do not forgive those who offend us, God will not forgive our offenses. And if God does not forgive our offenses, in no way will we enter heaven. The second Christian who will not enter heaven is one who does not know how to forgive others' offenses. Forgiveness is a fundamental aspect of the Christian faith, deeply rooted in the teachings of Jesus Christ. It is not merely a suggestion but a command from God, reflecting the very nature of His grace and mercy toward humanity. In Matthew 6, 14-15, Jesus clearly states, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This scripture emphasizes the conditional nature of divine forgiveness, making it clear that our willingness to forgive others is directly linked to God's willingness to forgive us. A Christian who harbors unforgiveness in their heart is essentially rejecting the core of the gospel, which is the message of reconciliation and redemption. Such a person fails to grasp the magnitude of their own forgiveness, how God, through Christ's sacrifice, has forgiven their sins. When we refuse to forgive, we place ourselves in opposition to God's will, allowing bitterness and resentment to take root, which can lead to spiritual stagnation and separation from God. Unforgiveness is a heavy burden that not only affects our relationship with others, but also hinders our spiritual growth and communion with God. It blinds us to the grace we have received and obstructs the flow of God's love in our lives. A Christian who does not forgive others is living in disobedience, and this disobedience carries severe consequences. 
As Jesus warned, those who do not forgive cannot expect to be forgiven, and without forgiveness there is no entry into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, it is imperative for every believer to examine their heart, release any grudges, and extend the same forgiveness that they have so graciously received from God. Thank you for being here and be a part of our Christian community. We hope today's message has touched your heart and inspired you in your walk with Christ. If this video has blessed you, please join the conversation in the comments below. Share your thoughts, experiences, and prayer requests. Let's build each other up in faith and support one another in prayer. Your voice matters, and your testimony can be a powerful encouragement to someone else. The third Christian who will not enter heaven is a Christian who cares more about pleasing the world than God. Let's see what James 4.4 has to say about this. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This passage, of course, does not mean that we cannot have friendships in the world or that we cannot occasionally share with unbelievers or those who do not share our faith. Jesus was a friend of many sinners and was even judged for eating and drinking with sinners. What this passage is talking about is loving worldly values above Christian values and trying to please the worldly system more than wanting to please God. What is extraordinary about this passage is the phrase, makes himself an enemy of God. The letter of James was addressed to believers around the world, and the warning again is that it is possible to be Christian and try to please the world more than God himself. Brothers in faith and in Christ, let us be certain that God will not let any of his enemies enter heaven. Anyone who wants to be a friend of the world and love values like lies, hypocrisy, and disloyalty will sadly end up outside the kingdom of heaven. But this might again raise the question, how should we then view the world? A true child of God sees this world as a place of passage, a place where we are mere strangers and pilgrims. Our citizenship is not of this world, as the Apostle Paul clearly states in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we also await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. While it is true that we cannot avoid contact with people of this world, a child of God should not allow worldly values such as lies, superficiality, and hypocrisy to shape their way of thinking. As our beloved Apostle Paul commanded in Romans 12 too, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We must be careful. The world will try every day to impose its temporary values on us. We must cleanse and renew our minds through the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The fourth Christian who will not enter the kingdom of heaven is a Christian who sins daily, voluntarily, and consciously. We know that Christ forgave all our sins on the cross and that there is no sin past, present, or future that is not covered by the precious blood of the Lamb. But what happens if our actions deny the blood that redeemed us? This is one of the most serious warnings in the Bible, recorded in the letter to the Hebrews 10, 26, 29. Let's see exactly what it says. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Verse 29. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? The warning is absolutely clear and forceful. A person who, after knowing Christ and being cleansed by his precious blood, decides to continue in their old way of life, is implicitly stating with their actions that the blood of Christ, which cleansed them of their sins, has no value. Do you understand the gravity of this matter? But what's really serious about this issue is that verse 27 clearly states that there is no longer any sacrifice for their sins. 
Christ died once for all to forgive all our sins. Christ's sacrifice cannot be repeated. If a person denies with their actions the precious value of the blood of Christ, they simply will not enter heaven. How should a child of God then view sin? Sin is something that can happen at any moment in our life. Absolutely no one is exempt from sinning and offending our Father, but a true child of God knows to recognize immediately when they have sinned. They will weep immediately after sinning, asking our Father to forgive them, and He mercifully will forgive and cleanse them from all unrighteousness, as stated in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if sin becomes the lifestyle of a Christian without causing them any pain or repentance, their destiny most certainly will not be heaven. Let us pause in a minute. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on our latest content. We regularly post videos that dive deeper into scripture, offer spiritual guidance, and share uplifting stories of faith. By subscribing, you're ensuring that you stay connected with a community of believers who are committed to growing in Christ together. The fifth Christian who will not enter heaven is a lukewarm Christian who trusts more in themselves than in the salvation that Christ offers them. The clear warning is found in Revelation 3.15-16. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Many might wonder what exactly being lukewarm means. It refers to nothing less than a Christian who has begun to trust more in themselves than in Christ, a Christian who has started to think that their physical possessions are more valuable than the spiritual treasures and gifts that God offers them. Consider verse 17. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The passage is a direct rebuke to all those who trust in their money and possessions and believe that once they have reached a certain level of material prosperity on earth, they no longer have anything to strive for day after day. Be careful. The Christian life is not about how much money we have on this earth or about how many material properties we have acquired, but about striving every day to follow Christ, adhering to His teachings and renouncing our selfishness and arrogance. But again, there is a very serious warning for these types of Christians. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. The passage clearly does not need further explanation. A Christian who has been spat out of God's mouth will in no way enter heaven. The sixth Christian who will not enter heaven is a Christian who does not love their neighbor and does not practice kindness to the needy. Christianity and love for one's neighbor are inseparable. A person who sincerely claims to follow Christ is necessarily a person who sacrifices for the well-being of others, just as Christ sacrificed for our well-being. It is absolutely contradictory to say that we are children of God and hate our neighbor, but let's let the Bible itself clarify this wonderful point in 1 John 4 20, 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Let us examine ourselves thoroughly so that we are not found lacking in love and mercy for the poor and needy. The verse clearly states that anyone who says they love God but does not love their neighbor is a liar. Be certain that God will not let any liar enter heaven. This leads us directly to the last point to fully understand this matter. The seventh Christian who will not enter heaven is a Christian who hates God's laws. This is probably one of the most challenging things that the Lord Jesus Christ himself pronounced in his famous Sermon on the Mount. Let's see what Jesus himself has to say about this in Matthew 5, 17-20. 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The verse makes three things absolutely clear. Christ did not come to abolish, break, or annul the law. God's law is absolutely valid even today, and our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now we know that Christ is our righteousness, and that He fulfilled the law to justify us, as stated in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. However, this does not mean in any way that we should hate God's law or despise it. Christ himself said that anyone who teaches not to obey God's commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Anyone who wishes to go against divine laws, practicing everything that God's law prohibits, such as injustice, lying, and immorality, will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Sadly, today there are many out there teaching that God's law is outdated and a thing of the past. Be very cautious of these types of teachings. Let's consider the warning that the Apostle Paul gives to all violators of God's law in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. In this verse, it is written that we should not lie, commit adultery, be idolatrous, or steal. But many may wonder, how then should a Christian view God's law? God's law is beautiful and complete, although it was not made to save man. These, then, are the Christians who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This, of course, does not mean that these are the only cases in the Bible where the danger of straying from the faith of Christ is warned. There are many other warnings in the Bible on this topic, but we hope that one thing becomes absolutely clear today. It is not making a prayer of faith, attending a church, or even giving our tithes and offerings that make us truly Christians, although we do not deny the importance of these things. Let us again remember the wise words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What then is the will of our Father? That we believe in the only begotten Son of God and faithfully follow his example until the end. True faith will never reject the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. He commanded us in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. A true Christian who has believed in the Son of God will walk in the same manner as Christ walked on this earth, without love for money, without covetousness, forgiving offenses, pleasing the Father rather than the world, hating sin and loving righteousness, loving and helping the poor, but above all, placing their entire trust in our Father. Only in this way will we be called true followers of Jesus and not have to turn away ashamed on the day when the glorious kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is revealed. Let us remember the glorious words recorded in 1 John 2, 6, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. The message of the text emphasizes the importance of living a genuine and authentic Christian life according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. In a world where being a Christian seems easy and accessible, true faith is proven by actions and a transformed heart. Jesus warned that not all who cry, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father. 
The text highlights seven types of Christians who will not enter heaven, each representing a significant failure in understanding and practicing the faith. The emphasis is on the need to, one, love God above wealth and material possessions. Two, forgive the offenses of others. A, please God, not the world. Four, avoid deliberately sinning. Five, be fervent in faith, fully trusting in the salvation offered by Christ. Six, love one's neighbor and practice kindness. Seven, respect and follow the laws of God. This reflection leads us to deep self-examination, questioning whether our lives are aligned with the teachings of Christ or if we are merely Christians in name. It's a call for true faith, which manifests in concrete actions of love, forgiveness, justice, and humility. Finally, Father, give us hearts obedient to your laws. May we see your law as a guide for our lives, living in love and justice according to your commandments. In Jesus' name we ask all these things, trusting that you hear our prayers and enable us to live according to your will. I hope you enjoyed the video. If this content was valuable to you, I ask for your support with your subscription so that you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Share this video with family and friends, give it a like, and leave your opinion in the comments. This helps the video reach more people. Together, we can illuminate more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.